Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also joining us, David Griffin. So happy to be here. It is confirmed. Floyd Mayweather Jr. and Conor McGregor oh. are fighting on August 26th. John, oh. you and I have been talking about it a long time. I am very excited. We're, it's not a blockbuster film, but it's a blockbuster fight. It's an embarrassment. <laughs> it is, <laughs> that is one of the worst circuses to ever be put on. It is horrible, and it should be canceled. What a dopey, dopey fight. Yeah, look, I'm sorry. I know this is not sports talk, but I, I got to at least say this. This is one I'm a huge fan of Conor McGregor. Uh, I respect the sport of boxing very much. This is a ludicrous, stupid, stupid thing. Like, didn't they learn anything? Well, who was the, the the former heavyweight champion that went into an MMA James ring? Tony. Tony, when he tried Tony, to fight yeah. uh, Randy the Natural Couture. And, he got wrecked. and Couture just spanked him. It's I mean, the it was, opposite it was, thing. And this it's is the opposite Thunder thing. Lips versus Rocky. It is, it, it is an absolute moronic thing that is going to ruin one of the two images, and it's just going to rip people off, and Mayweather's going to run around for a little bit, and it's, it's so dumb. You know, it's just it's just so dumb I'm that excited. you're doing this. I'm excited. Why? That's another it's conversation. It's, it's, another it's another conversation. what sports is. But you want to pay $30 to watch that crap? I, I pay for it. Why? <laughs> It's my money. I'll do it alone. <laughs> <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Let's get on with the show. As happens sometimes. Hey, guys, a trailer dropped just as we were about to start the show. Natasha, tell us about it. Paramount Pictures has released the first trailer for Daddy's Home 2. The comedy sequel finds Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg's characters from the first movie now dealing with their intrusive fathers, played by Mel Gibson and John Lithgow. Director San Sean Anders returns from the first film working from a script he co-wrote with his Where the Millers co-writer, John Morris. Daddy's Home 2 opens in theaters on November 10th. Okay, look, first of all, when I even heard that the trailer had dropped, uh, part of me was like, hey, I didn't even know they'd started filming the next one, to be honest with you. I totally forgot about that. And it's like, I did not like the first Daddy's Home. Didn't like it. Uh, even though I liked the guys involved, I even liked the director, I mean, I, but it, the movie did not work for me. And I think that was kind of the sentiment around the room. Then we put on the trailer. And damn if I didn't laugh my ass off during the trailer. I mean, it was a great trailer, and, which raises the big philosophical question. If what will probably turn out to be bad movies can put out great trailers, mm -hmm. why cannot movies that will probably turn out to be great put out great trailers, What, whatever? The moment Mel Gibson came down the escalator and then the pile on of the joke with John Lithgow coming down. I Look, I, like I said, I did not like the first one. I'm not predicting the second one's gonna be any good. But you call it what, like you see it. That trailer was hilarious. I loved it. And now suddenly, I'm at least curious to see this movie while before I couldn't have shipped it fast enough. Anyway, Christian, you watched the trailer with me. Mm. What did you think? Well, first of all, we start off by saying that I thought that the first one was terrible. I watched that first movie saying, oh, it's a good cast. You got Farrell and, and, and Wahlberg. They've had good chemistry in the nice guys. So let's, let, not the nice guys, what's it called? What was it called? The other guys. The other guys, mm -hmm. the other guys. Um, so when I saw that, I was, it was encouraged, but it, then this thing comes out. And like you, I was like, oh, yeah, right. They're making daddy's, whatever this stupid thing is, too. It, it starts, and they have this bit with Wahlberg and Farrell back and forth with the whatever, the cookies. and Snickerdoodles. Like, whatever it is. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, here we go again. This is just a, a movie that I just don't care about. And then Gibson shows up. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, wait a minute. This, dynamic, this is like a meet the parents type thing. This dynamic's going to be funny. And then Lithgow shows up. And that moment where him and Farrell kiss each other on the lips, that character's dad, that is his dad. That, uh, Gibson is that character's dad. And then the joke with the, with the, with the hookers. Tell us a joke, Grandpa. All right, I got a joke. Two dead hookers wash up on the no, show. No, 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 no. Like, <laughs> it was set up. It was a very well put together trailer. I don't have high hopes in the movie itself, but from the trailer, the way they pitch it, it looks significantly better than the first movie. So, yeah, it was a good trailer, and it made me laugh. 
David it's Gordon a perfect Jenkins. vehicle for Mel Gibson. I mean, he yeah. it, it's great for him to play like the inappropriate grandpa. You know, like, what's he going to say? Crazy grandpa, what's he going to say? Because that's how Mel Gibson is kind of, you know, that's what his image is right now. Does he start you know? yelling racial slurs? Exactly. Is he going to do that? He might do that, but it, it, it looks so perfect. And it's kind of like a reverse of the first one. Of course, it was about the, the dads coming yeah. together with Mark Wahlberg. And now it's about the grandpas. You know, you see Mel Gibson, the kids embracing John Lithgow as he comes in. You can see he feels a little like, you know, how come the kids aren't doing that to me? You know, so I think it's going to be about them coming together. And of course, if this one's as successful or close to what the first one was, I'm sure we'll get a third one with another story. I didn't know it made over two hundred million dollars in the box office. Yeah, it made close. Just shy, the first one made just shy two hundred fifty million worldwide. The box oh, office. That's worldwide. Okay. worldwide. But still, like, a fifty million dollar budget. budget. Just domestically, made over one hundred and fifty million dollars. That's just very domestically. Yeah. For yeah. a fifty million dollar movie, mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's just printing money. It makes yeah. sense why they made it. It's yeah, just, it's I, just, been I just quiet. wasn't happy when I heard that. They yeah, did it's it. just been quiet, and I think that yeah, it makes a lot of sense, and maybe. This is one of those things that the comedy sequel is actually better than the first one. That is yeah. very rare. It's extremely mm -hmm. rare. All right, Natasha, what's next? Deadline is reporting that 20th Century Fox has officially formalized their plans on their X-Men universe next movie, Dark Phoenix, with longtime X-Men producer and writer Simon Kinberg signing on to make his directorial debut on the movie with Jennifer Lawrence, Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy, Nicholas Holt, Alexander Shipp, Sophie Turner, Ty Sheridan, and Cody Smith-McPhee, all returning to reprise their respective roles. Deadline also confirms that Jessica Chastain is in official talks to join the movie as its main villain, Lilandra, the empress of an alien empire called the Shi'ar, who leads the quest to imprison and execute Dark Phoenix, leading her into conflict with the X-Men. The, uh, the studio also set a release date for, of Friday, November 2nd, 2018. John, what are your thoughts on Simon Kinberg directing Dark Phoenix with the original cast and Jessica Chastain as the villain? Well, there's a, there's a couple things in the story that are encouraging, a couple things in the story that are a little bit concerning. Mm -hmm. I like if you watch a show for any period, of, you know I'm a big Simon Kinberg fan. I am. However, I'm always very apprehensive about the notion of somebody, no matter how long they've been in the film industry, making the directorial debut with a big budget tentpole film. I, I had the same concerns when they remember back uh, a while ago they were announced Roberta Orsi was going to direct right. mm -hmm. that, that Star Trek film, yeah. and then that kind of fell apart, and, and probably for the best. I mean, I'd like to see Orsi direct, but I'd like to see you know somebody cutting their teeth in the director's chair for the first time on something a little more smaller budget. Let them work out how they tell their stories visually. Uh, but again, I, I mean, I'm a huge Kimbert fan, so let's see, let's see what he does with this. The other bit of concern for me on this is that while I am a massive Jennifer Lawrence fan, this girl to me, top 10 actresses working in the business today, she's got you know an Academy Award on her mantle for a reason. She's going to have more before her career is done. She's a great actress, but she is terrible in these movies. It, like you can just, she just never seems like she cares mm -hmm. that she's in these movies, and it seems like she's floating through it. And the studio made the wrong decision about well, since we've got this big star, let's make the let's change the story and make the movie about her character Mystique, who is a C level X Men character, and they suddenly make it about her. My fear is that by with Jennifer Lawrence returning, this is going to once again become a Mystique kind of centric film. Now you can make the argument that Apocalypse really wasn't a Mystique centric, but she was more in the center of that story yeah. than she should have been. Uh, but then there's the good news. Michael Fassbender's coming back. McAvoy's coming back. Good news, good news. Mm -hmm. Jessica Chastain, who I would put in that top 10 actresses working today with Jennifer Lawrence, coming on. That's always good news. And so, look, I was disappointed with Apocalypse. I think overall I still kind of enjoyed it, but to me it, it is one of the worst X-Men films they've done. Certainly not worse than X-Men 3. But, uh, hey, there's some good news in here, some bad news in here. I'm curious to see how it shakes out. Now, you had, you and I talked about the whole Jennifer Lawrence thing yesterday, and you had a really nice counter for me to that. Well, yeah, well I mean, I, I totally understand all your concerns here. Uh, let, let's start with the Kinberg part of it, is that with Orsi, I also agree with you. I think that was, that was a tough thing to throw someone in like that because Orsi coming in to just direct, that was tough. That would have been really tough yeah. for him to do. Kinberg's a different animal, and granted, just producing and directing two different things but Kimberg had has way more experience on the sets collaboration than someone like Orsi did. sure yeah Kinberg is involved in movies like The Martian the entire um, X-Men franchise S Star Wars he's worked with top directors he's been around for a bit his, he, he's got a lot more mileage um, so 
he's probably been gearing up to something like this for a long time. That doesn't mean he's going to necessarily knock it out of the park, but he's also someone that's been involved with the X-Men franchise for a very long time and has probably been formulating mm -hmm. how he would do a movie. So my confidence in him would be a lot more than someone like, say, uh, Roberto Orsi doing his first movie. Right. Um, now, as far as the Jennifer Lawrence goes thing, I agree with you. I think that I had... I probably out of everybody here and most people I had I didn't have as many problems with her in the last movie but she certainly wasn't as locked in as I thought I thought she was a little bit more locked into um X-Men First Class than she was in the last one but I also think she's one of these actresses that does listen to critics she does listen to the audience and I think that it was clear most people were like that was just Jennifer Lawrence in makeup and not as committed. I do think that we're going to see a different side of Jennifer Lawrence, mm -hmm. and I also don't think that we're going to have Jennifer Lawrence leading just this thing because Jessica Chastain is also a big talent, a big star. So you're not going to get her to play second fiddle to Jennifer Lawrence. Fassbender's at a place right now in his career, as is McAvoy after coming off a turn like Split, that you're not going to just see them – play second fiddle to Jennifer Lawrence. I think it would be very beneficial to Simon Kinberg and the writers here to make it all this big kind of melting pot. Give Lawrence her moments to shine, but don't put her front and center. Let the villain have a lot of screen time. Let Fassbender have a little bit more time. Let McAvoy have his time and do that what we want to see in an X-Men film and give them all. And I, I, I've, got, I've got some hope for this film. David. John, I know, I mean, you've, you've told stories before in a sense. You, you have a film out. You have a book that you've you know you've written. You you've crafted stories like that before. I think for me, Kinberg has had his own education, being in the producer's chair, being in the writer's chair, the guy who's made the notes, the guy who's probably received some notes. And it's I feel like his education in that film system is just as good as maybe going to USC film school that he's done over the years. So I think he my, I, this is a big project, but he's been around big projects all the time. So I think this might be actually a good vehicle for him for, to step into and direct for his first time. Also, we're talking a lot about McAvoy, Fassbender, and Jennifer Lawrence, all great actors. Don't forget, this is the Dark Phoenix saga. We need to be talking about Sophie Turner. This should be her story. Dark Phoenix mm -hmm. saga is about point. Jean yeah. Grey. I mean, and right now, nobody's talking about you know, it. We're talking about Sophie yeah. Turner. I mean, I realize that all she's really done so far is Game of Thrones, and we've seen her grow in Game of Thrones. She's gotten better and better after each season. So I hope for her, this is her time to shine, her time to step up. I realize she's not going to sell tickets like a Jennifer Lawrence would, but she needs to step up because the Dark Phoenix saga is about her going mad, and that's going to be a tough story to tell. Let me ask you guys, as <clears> both <throat> of you guys are, are okay with him doing and again, I'm a yes. huge Kimberg fan, and I'm yeah. really curious, but let's say you're the head of Fox. And let's take a uh, timeline out of the question for a second. And you say, Kimberg's interested in moving into directing. Mm. And you have your choice. It's up to you. Kimberg's ambivalent. So it's like, would you rather have Kimberg direct his first film, a $40 million more story-driven film, or hand him a $175 million temple project? What would you want his first one to be? I'll tell you what, I probably would go with the X-Men movie. Really? Um, the, uh, with Kinberg. That's intriguing. It's because it's Kinberg. Because it's just, this is a guy, that, like I said, he's just been so involved with, with this franchise for so long that it's like he's not one of these guys just like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to really be involved and put my name on it. He is hands, He's in there. His, his, his hands are dirty with all this stuff. He, he's really got a vision for the X-Men. And I think that he probably has a good pitch in the room for why he should be doing it. He's probably been talking to the execs for a very long time. It wasn't just like, hey, by the way, you want to direct the next one? They've probably been in talks for doing this for quite a bit. So if it came across my desk, if I was in that position, I'd say that's very intriguing. You know what? After talking, and he's a charming guy, too. So oh, probably, he's extremely likable. So very I'm going to go ahead and say I'd probably take that one for sure. He's had successes and failures, so I would take him, too, because he, had, he wrote uh, X-Men Days Future Past. He also did Apocalypse. You know, one was obviously a little better than the other well, one. So he's, the Brett Ratner one. Yeah, too. he's seen both sides of it. So I mean, yeah. he he has that experience. He's failed before. Right. So I think well, that's so Kevin Feige. I mean, Kevin True. Feige produced yeah, one exactly. of those fantastic four yeah. films. Right. Or whatever. So I mean, they can learn from that. And be like, okay, that didn't work, but people love X Men: Days Future Past. The themes in here, storytelling. Let's focus on that. I think this is the perfect guy for this. I really do. Not that he's the best director uh, I, out there, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I just, he's right I, for this. I still, I'm just struggling with the mm -hmm. idea of a guy who has never di actually directed a mm -hmm. film before is the perfect guy to direct a big blockbuster, but. I mean, I'm a big fan. Let's see if he crushes it. Yeah. Uh, let's go with that. All right, what's next? 
In a new and extensive Facebook Live Q&A with Marvel head honcho Kevin Feige, the studio head talked about how the Marvel vs. DC Comics feud doesn't extend to the people working behind the scenes. With the recent success of Wonder Woman proving, proving big at the box office, Feige as well had only good things to say about DC and its fearless leader Jeff Johns. Speaking in the Facebook Live chat, Feige said, There's not really a rivalry. The rivalry is much more amongst the press, I think. Jeff Johns is a very good friend of mine. We grew up together in the business and recently celebrated Richard Donner, who we both used to work for. So I applaud all the success he's had. I really just look at it as a fan. When the movies perform well and are well received, it's good for us, which is why I'm always rooting for them. Christian, what do you think about Feige's comments about DC and Marvel? We've been saying this for so long. I mean, it's you got to remember that the superhero genre is a genre. It's a genre. It's not just like all oh, superhero movies are gonna they're gonna burn out. It has become very similar to where horror movies, mm. action adventure movies, superhero movies are a genre. So if you are part of the genre, you want it to do well. Like people always say, here's another example: Schmodown and movie fights. It's they're game shows. I want movie fights to do amazing. Movie fights want Schmodown to do amazing because there are they're the same, they're the audience. They want that kind of you want you want that 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 fun and people to be excited about what you are doing. Wonder Woman, it's in the same type of thing that what they're gonna do with with their next Avengers movie. It's like people get excited for that stuff. So it it it, it makes so much sense. We've talked about this for a very long time. You want you absolutely want Feige to be that guy who's rooting for it because they run in the same circles. They run, now there's gonna always be that competition. Don't 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 let them fool you. Like they want they when they put out a certain movie, they want it to do better than the DC movie. Of course they do. I mean that that's part of it. But they're never rooting against it because if Wonder Woman or these other movies, if the audiences stop watching them and don't get excited about them, then that means uh oh then that mean are they going to stop watching our movies too because they're just getting tired of this genre now? So Feige's always been a smart dude. Feige knows how this business works, and he's not. And and to be also the other side of that too. Even if he was, he's not going to say, "Yeah, we don't. We're not rooting for them. We're not." But but I tend to take him at his, as his word because it, business size, it, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, th this is something we have been saying forever. Like it's look if you put. Uh, I don't know. Take me and uh, uh, Sam, for ex for example. Um, so we go in and do uh, Schmodown, Whitworth. whatever. Yeah. yeah. So Whitwer. You know, I've, I I like Sam very much. I think he's a great dude. Do I want to do better than him? Sure, I do. I beat him twice, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, but I also want him to do great. I want him to do great. But yeah, the competitive part of me, I want to do better. Does Feige want a Marvel film to be the top? box office earner of the comic book genre that year over DC film? Sure he does. But it's it kind of goes back to the same thing that uh, Henry Cavill said. Right. Remember Henry Cavill talked about yeah. this not too long ago. Henry Cavill loves Marvel movies and he cheers for them and he mm -hmm. wants them to do great because Henry Cavill said, because if they do great, that means the audience will love comic book movies more, which means more people will come to see our comic book movie. It's something that is so simple that Jeff Johns, Kevin Feige, mm -hmm. Henry Cavill, uh, Chris, um, Evans? Chris Evans, that all of them have talked about and said, and they all understand, but it's really frustrating sometimes when you keep reading some fans who just don't get it. There is no, there's a de definitely a DC Marvel rivalry, but it's a fun, competitive, a rising tide raises all ships kind of thing. That's why I always tell like people who are stone cold, hardcore, corporate zombie slaves of Marvel that just won Marvel City. It's like, you better be cheering for DC movies to do well. It doesn't, whether you like them or not is different, but you should be cheering for them to do well because that will be better for the Marvel films. And if you like love DC and hate Marvel, you should be cheering for Marvel films and hoping mm -hmm. they do well because that will translate into good things or at least give a little bit of an advantage to DC films later when they come out. The presidents understand this. The talent understands this. The fans need to understand this too. What do you make of his comments? I, I like what you guys said, but I still think there's uh, a deep rivalry there. Not to a rivalry point where they're enemies. Obviously, I believe Feige says him and John's grew up together, they're friends. I believe that. But just like in any sport, you know, people admire each other, but there's still that that competitiveness to win, of whether course. it's in the business world, the market. Yeah. Like yeah. talking about Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor. All I heard yesterday with Dana in Floyd's uh, uh, per, his rep was saying that look, I respect I respect Conor, I respect Floyd, I respect Conor, I respect Floyd, but 
you know, you want them to garner as much uh, adoration as they can because when they come together, they're going to make tons of money, right? right. That's Absolutely. the whole point. Yeah. But, John, when you say every time you start this show, this is the best damn movie-related show on the planet, you are speaking that into actuality because you believe it, and I believe that you believe it. Now, it doesn't mean you don't like the guys from Screen Junkies or IGN or any other uh, Internet site that does what we do, but you believe that this is the best because you come out here every day and you bring your best and you want it to happen. And that's, that's fight. That's fire. That's competitiveness. Sure. You can still be friends. You can still be nice. You'll shake somebody's hand, not talk smack. But it is a competitive spirit. Well, yeah, sure. well, the arguing that. The, yeah, the, yeah the, the difference there is, the difference there is like, so like our friends over at Screen Junkies. Mm -hmm. Do I want to do better? Do I want to be better than? Absolutely. But I also understand that the healthier, like somebody like Screen Junkies right. or other online movie sites and stuff, the better that, you know, Chris Stuckman does, the better mm -hmm. that Jeremy Johns does, the better that, that the whole market becomes is ultimately good for us. Sure. Do I want us to be the best? Do I want to win? Yes. Of course. But I want them to succeed. Mm -hmm. I want everybody else to succeed because if they're succeeding, that means our space is growing. Right. Right. People are and interested good. in what we're doing. And more the, and more. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, and I think that's what we're, I think mm -hmm. we're all saying the same thing. Right, it's right. All, we're all saying that, Feige legitimately wants the space to do well, but they want Marvel to be the best in the space. Yeah, like if you and I are competing in, in Schmodown, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I want to win, yeah. but that doesn't mean I want you to fail. Right. Yeah. I and he want wants you to, to do great. better in your next match yeah. for when you guys play. It looks better on him when he beats True. you. And yeah. like the best matches we've had in Schmodown, keep keeping on the Schmodown down analogy, it's those ones where the competitors push each other right. to the limit and it goes to the final question. Mm -hmm. Those are the best ones. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you want to win, <laughs> but you don't necessarily want the other guy to fail. Right. All mm -hmm. right, anyway, that's just kind of one way to look at it, I guess. Hey guys, listen, it is Thursday, which means we're going to talk about some of the films that are opening this week. Now, on Tuesday, we talked about a couple of them, but there are two more opening wide this week. Natasha, tell us about them. Seven Meters Down is opening this week. Young Sisters, Kate and Lisa. 47 travel. Meters Down? Seven Meters Down. 40, Did no, I say 47. 47? Yeah, oh, it's, it's 47. 47. Just kidding, typo. 47. Seven meters down is a far less scary <laughs> version of it. <laughs> Are we like good? Yeah, version. let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> There's like fish. Yeah. Okay, 47 meters down. Young sisters Kate and Lisa travel to Mexico for a vacation filled with fun and adventure. Lisa needs some extra persuasion when Kate suggests that they go diving in shark infested waters. Their worst fears soon become a reality when the cage breaks away from their boat, sending them plummeting to the ocean floor with a dwindling supply of oxygen and rough night is also coming out five best friends from college reunite 10 years later for a wild bachelorette weekend in miami their hard partying takes a hilarious dark turn when they accidentally kill a male stripper <laughs> amid the craziness of trying to cover it up they're ultimately brought closer together when it matters most i'm actually kind of looking forward to watching both of these now i, I skipped a 47 meters down uh screening last night just because i was exhausted but i am looking i'm going to go out this weekend and watch both of these films Rough Night has been an interesting one to me because Rough Night is one to me that I thought the trailers looked really good, but I still didn't know if the movie was going to be any. I kind of mm. suspected the movie wouldn't be good, but the trailers I've really liked. So on that level alone, I'm really curious to see it. 47 Meters Down is a movie that on paper did not interest me, and then I saw the trailers and thought, they're putting this together really well, so I'm really curious to see it. So for me, honestly, it's kind of an equal split between my anticipation for both of these. I'm going to go out and see both of them. David, which one of these two are you looking forward to seeing more? Uh, I'm more of a 47 Meters Down kind of guy. I just Sharks in the water just terrifies me. I don't get what's up with these people. They go down to Mexico and like, hey, let's go deep deep in the water and see what happens. Blake Lively tried it in the shallow. It's like, stop doing that. Let's go stop see going what in the water. It's like, hey, let's go in shark infested waters. Let's see what happens. Um, but it looks, it just looks fun. Like it's going to be campy. It's going to be silly. You know, kind of like was those piranha movies. And as long as the movie doesn't take itself too seriously, it could be fun. Rough Night looks like it could be entertaining. But if, I don't know, it doesn't, Nothing stood out to me about it. I do, I do like the cast. I love Scarlett Johansson. Guys, his Zoe yeah. uh, Kravitz is incredible. So, but if I was going to pick a ticket right now, it would be 47 Meters Down. What about you? I've seen, I've seen Rough Night, and I'll talk about mm. that in a second. But uh, 47 Meters Down, um, I, I, again, missed the screening last night. I do want to see it because I, initially I thought it was going to be like a, a Sharknado type movie. I was like, why right. is Mandy Moore doing this after the success of uh, this, is this Is Us? Yeah. So I'm like, what? But, you know, it, it makes sense she can now lead one of these kind of horror movies, and maybe it could be a lot of fun. So I I am curious. I want to see how it is. Rough Night. I actually did not like the trailers. Um, there was oh, a, that's right. Yeah, I didn't like the trailers at all, and I was and I was curious to see what was going to happen. But I did like the the actresses involved. What I will start by saying is that Kate McKinnon, over the, the, the when she started on Saturday Night Live, I loved her, and then I thought she was just trying to overtake people with her faces, and like, and I thought that's all she did in Ghostbusters. So I was like, oh, is this going to be another one? I'm disappointed. Kate McKinnon's awesome in this movie. 
really good in this film. Has a great dynamic with Scarlett Johansson, who does a fantastic job as leading the film as the straight, uh, the straight-laced one, getting married, and all the craziness ensues. Didn't love Gillian Bell. Thought Sinead DeFries was great in the movie. Um, it, uh, <laughs> but, 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 I, but I do think Zoe Kravitz was really good. The mm -hmm. dynamic with the girls worked. They went for shock value all of, all of the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it hits. I thought most of the time it didn't. Um, I thought that were, the dynamic of what they were doing with the women kind of worked. But then once they go off on this crazy kind of crime storyline, mm -hmm. I thought it missed completely. I think some people will enjoy it. I didn't really like it that much. I liked it better than the trailers but I still thought that it missed in, in the way of comedy. Mm. All right, folks, so it's time for us to move on to buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Natasha, what do we got? Okay, Empire Magazine recently ran a feature on the future of the Transformers movies, and thanks to Transformers World, who followed up on that story, we now know that the new Bumblebee spinoff movie no, will take... No, it's, his name's Bumble. Oh. I'm you? kidding. I'm kidding. I was no, like, Riley? <laughs> Seven Bumble. Seven Bumble. Seven meters down starring Bumble. Yes. <laughs> okay. We now know that the new Bumblebee spinoff movie will take place in the 1980s. Director Travis Knight's prequel will also not be as busy or as large as Michael Bay's Transformers movies, but rather will focus on a lighter tone with fewer robots and a return to the boy and his car storyline introduced in the first movie. Haley Steinfeld will reportedly play a tomboy who also holds a job as a mechanic after school she where does. she comes in contact with Bumblebee. The movie is gearing up for production now with a release date set for June 8th, 2018. David, do you buy or sell the Bumblebee movie taking place in the 80s? It's tough. I feel like Transformers always sucks me in. It's like a big vortex. It just sucks <laughs> me into everything it does. I always go see the movies and I always leave disappointed. No, uh, I, I buy it. I buy it. I buy it for a few reasons. Travis Knight, uh, because of what we did with Kubo and the Two Strings. That was one of my favorite films last year. I enjoyed that. I, I think Haley Seinfeld is going to be one of the best I think she's one of the better actresses, young actresses out there right now. Is mm -hmm. Edge of Seventeen? Was she did last year fantastic. She can hold her own, and we know she's talented. So if she's with the right crew, this is going to be the first Transformer movies that we've had without Michael Bay as the lead director. So maybe it's going to be something different. You know, maybe we're going to see something new here. I, I have to hope that the '80s is cool because that's when Transformers came out. We're also getting Ducktales is coming back on TV from the '80s. I mean, <laughs> it's a reemergence of the '80s. '80s is in right now. Stranger Things, like '80s is, is cool right now. So I'm, I'm definitely buying this. Sell. No. Christian. <laughs> no, no reason why. Yeah. All right. I, I well, don't. then I'll counter. Um, I, I'm going to buy it. I, I, I'll I'm let a, you guys carry this. Yeah, well, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to tell you that I think that there is, I know your, your thoughts on it. And what I, will, mm. what I will say is that I think that all your concerns as far as the fact that it's, it's an 80s movie with, with Bumblebee and it's, what, what are we going to do? Are we just going to play a nostalgia here? Why Bumblebee to be the one that leads? And I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that. I think, but... It really intrigues me to see what can be done when Michael Bay is in directing one of these things. It could be an absolute disaster. It might not be that great at all. But and I still and I said it when they announced Haley Steinfeld, who I love. I don't want the human to be the lead. I want the Transformers to be the lead. Now, if this turns out to be an ET movie, it's like they've done a million times before with the alien and and the friend, it's essentially what they did in the first Transformers mm -hmm. movie anyway. Um, if it's just that and there's no other Transformers, I don't know if I'm going to love it. But if I think that they actually make a Transformers movie that I've wanted to see, and they and they put it in the '80s when the movie came out with some, fun, like he's going to be that Volkswagen, just like oh hell, uh, he better be. He's going to be. And and Bumble, and he, this movie's in the '80s and it's a Bumblebee yeah. movie. If Bumblebee ain't a VW. Mm -hmm. I don't even know I'm going to go see this. Well, I want to see <laughs> it. It better be a bug. Look, I really like Travis Knight is that, and yeah, who yeah. directed it, and he did Cuban Two Strings. I think the what he did emotionally with that film could be very interesting with this. So I'm very curious, and it has a lot to do. I'm not going to I'm going to be completely honest. It has a lot to do with the fact that Michael Bay, he's going to produce it, I'm sure, have some kind of saying it that way, but he's not directing it. And mm -hmm. I want to see what a Transformers movie looks like without Michael Bay. Now, it should be noted, too, we're seeing... We're seeing the new Transformers movie Monday. on Monday. Monday, yeah. And, I, I mean, look, keep everything, the possibilities open. There's a chance we walk out of that movie loving it. And then all of a sudden that may change our perception of the entire franchise. So let's keep our minds open to that as well, mm. and we'll see what happens. All right, what's next? According to THR, a Crooked Man spinoff will be the next movie in the Conjuring universe. Based on a story by original Helmer James Wan, the movie is now the third entity to get its own movie after Annabelle and the Nun. Mike Van Ways has been hired to pen the script, which will utilize the English nursery rhyme as a jumping off point. No release date, director, or actors have been announced at this time. John, do you buy or sell a Crooked Man spinoff movie? I'm going to sell it simply on the basis of, 
Oh, like, what are we gonna do now? Every Conjuring movie, every kind of scary thing gets its own. Is that what we're basing the entire franchise on? Like, so we had Annabelle, we've got The Nun coming, now we get the Crooked Man. I, I mean, just expand it a little bit. And I, I did find the Crooked Man scenes in the movie to be pretty creepy, and that was cool. But I liked it in that context. I don't necessarily need to see an entire movie base. Annabelle was worth swinging at. And I know Annabelle 2 is coming out here pretty soon. But then they're doing The Nun and that Crooked Man. It just, I don't know. It feels like they're grasping at things to me. So for me, I'm going to sell it. What about you, David? I, I'm going to buy it because I think I like how James Wan's kind of creating his, like a Marvel Cinematic Universe version of, but it's a Conjuring Cinematic Universe. And like you said, John, it's a good point. They are just kind of grabbing every scary character. I guess it's giving them an automatic spinoff. But because they don't have you know an assortment of comic books to draw from, that's all they really have. So they could do original ideas, but I think... You can tell, still tell a good original story, but use the Conjuring as a backing to help it financially. I think to help it, you know, do better in the box office. So I'm, I'm going to buy the idea. Just less CGI this time. I thought it was just too much CGI in Conjuring too. Christian, uh, I'm going to buy it. Strangely enough, I think that I actually think that the Crooked Man lends itself more than Annabelle does. I mm. think that Annabelle's the, the mythology behind it is kind of creepy, and and you could do some stuff with it. But I think that the Crooked Man, I want to learn more about it. it. I do agree with you though. I'd like to see them scale back on the CGI because mm -hmm. it looked like something out of like a Tim Burton movie. Right. Um, uh, but I want to see. I want to see more about this guy. I think it could be really kind of terrifying. I want to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, so yeah, I think that it could be, and I actually agree with you, David, to where you say like, it's this kind of all s certain shared universe here that they're mm -hmm. doing and it's it's a way to do it in the horror and you do them for cheap, cheaper, and you could make a, a good profit off it. And still someone like James Wan doesn't just make those slasher films to make slasher films. He puts some real feel in it and he's producing this one. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, guys, well, I want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video. A little bit later today, a brand new episode of Christian Harloff and his Collider Jedi Council. That goes up a little bit later today. Also, of course, every Friday, new episodes of Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns on the Verizon Go 90 Network. It's free. Go and check that out there. One of the shows that we're really proud of that we produce here. And also, tomorrow, an episode of the Movie Trivia Schmodown that you're going to want to go out Grab some popcorn, grab some drinks, sit back. If you want to talk about a match with contrasting styles, you got it. Josh McCuga and Drew McWeeny. That goes tomorrow. Here's a little preview. I don't know who I'm fighting next time, but I want somebody. But I'm here, guys. I'm here for you. I'm the wild man, I'm the people's champ, or just the people's middle guy that they want to hang out with at a bar. Uh, learning to be humbled a bit, that's always good, especially in a league like this, because it is about the matches that you have over time, and it's about the final stats. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. I've got an appetite for it now. So, sure, this was a rough one. I'll be back next time. Makuga versus McWeeny, you will not want to miss that one tomorrow. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email them into us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We take a question every day, Monday through Friday, but we also have a weekend mailbag show that we have on weekends on Saturday and Sunday where all we do is take your mailbag questions, send them on in. So, Natasha, what is in the mailbag today? Okay, Sarvesh writes, do you think we have reached the peak of the comic book superhero movie genre with recent films like Logan and Civil War and has the decline as predicted by Steven Spielberg who compared the superhero genre to westerns already begun. Must forthcoming films be more mature and blend genres to still capture the intrigue of audiences or will studios continue to strive towards that commercial and global market which contributes to the massive box office numbers we have come to expect? Thanks. You know, it's, it's funny. Ever since, oh gosh, I'd say maybe Captain America, the first Avenger, maybe going back even before that, every year, without question, this is the year the comic book movies start to decline. This is the year the comic book movie fatigue sets in. Every year, without question, and every year, 500 million plus movie after 500 million plus movie after 500 million plus movie after billion dollar plus movie after 700 million dollar plus movie. Yeah, and yet every year, every single year, this is the year that the decline is going to start. And I think what we're seeing is, is we're seeing, though, the comic book movie genre, I think at this point, is really just starting to hit maturity. And when I say hit maturity, I don't mean they're making more mature films. I'm saying, you know, there have been eras where comic book movies were kind of cut from the same cloth. You had better ones and you had worse mm -hmm. ones. But now we live in an era where the comic book movie genre is flourishing 
with a multitude of subgenres that attach themselves to it, which really differentiate one comic book movie from another. Logan, as you brought up in the email, is a great example. It is a very much a Western. It's a um, unforgiven. It is the unforgiven of comic book movie genre. At the same time, you've got Ant-Man, which is a very lighthearted, Crime heist film. crime kind of uh, mm -hmm. you know actioneer film. At the same time, you've got Captain America Civil War or Captain America Winter Soldier, which is very much like a political intrigue movie. You now have these comic book movies that are not solely defined by the genre of comic book movie. Every comic book movie now has mm -hmm. a subgenre attached, and we're just seeing the maturation of that now. Look, when we hit a year where no comic book movie hits 500 million at the box office, we can start talking about the decline of the comic book film. We're not there yet. Will it happen? Everything mm -hmm. happens in cycles. Some people thought hair metal would last forever. Not so much. The Western would last forever. Not so much. Everything comes and goes in cycles. And at some point, the comic book movie will be the same. But we're not there yet. And I think we're still quite a ways away from it, to be honest, if I'm going to be honest about it. Anyway, what do you think about that, David? Yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. And like hair metal bands, John Bon Jovi is still kicking. He's, He's still right. touring. Right. He's right. still got it. He's still looking good. He just, just cut the hair. Yeah. You just do something <laughs> a little bit different. So I think you made a great point with that because there are so many subgenres. I still wish we get a Black Widow film. You could make that like a Jason Bourne style, like, you know, spy, espionage kind of thing going on there. You can, And you have Thor. Thor's more like a fantasy. It's like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings combined. And then, you know, you have Captain America even was more like a Jason Bourne. I mean, you have all these different genres you can hit. Well, if you're doing a Western, you're kind of stuck doing a Western. But comic book movies don't have to worry about doing that. So yeah, even if they have a superhero attached to them, they can do so many different things. Daredevil on Netflix is different than Luke Cage. Right. You know, they're very different stories, even though they're set in the same universe. So I don't think we're at a decline. I think, like John said, once we get below a certain maybe 500 million a year, then maybe we'll talk about it. Well, that's exactly <clears> right, <throat> though. I think that that's what people are misinformed with when they mm -hmm. say like, oh, it's the comic book movie because that, you're right. It's like it's with the westerns. That's the format every single time. Mm -hmm. Is you know what it looks like, and that's a western. So it, that's how it could decline because it's the same thing over and over again. These are not the same movies. Like Captain America One is significantly different than Captain America Two right. in tone, in format, and everything about it. And so when you and when you look at a movie like you mentioned, Guardians of the Galaxy, Space Opera, there's, they're different movies. Yes, they're comic book movies, but they they could fit into sci-fi fantasy mm -hmm. to where Logan can fit into a almost a Western if, right. if you could there's so many there, there's just so much that's going on in all of this like you know you could put Wonder Woman as, as a war film yeah that's certain, but there, there's Deadpool kind of like action comedy that's the yeah. thing is that these movies themselves yes on the, the ultimate genre where they with the mothership where they fit in is comic book movie but they also fit into these other genres mm -hmm. so that's what's different about these and until the big name directors and writers and uh, and actors and actresses stop being a part of these movies. People are invested the same way they are in television shows right now, and that's what happened with this shared universe is because mm -hmm. it's an ongoing television show. The season finale hasn't happened yet. Yep. The series finale certainly hasn't happened yet. So it's like when those things start to happen, it's like, well, what's next? And if they don't switch it up, and it starts to be repetitive, and the same thing, and they got away, even Spider-Man got away from now telling me that the reason Spider-Man it was starting to st seem stale. You kept doing origin stories, and people, fans, said, stop telling me about how this guy became Spider-Man. We know, right. and now they're, they're they're changing that up. It's like I got like a John Hughes feel to it now. So there are way they they are they they have a benefit to be able to switch up genres inside of their genre. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, for the last part of the show here, we're going to go to Twitter and take your Twitter questions. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. Once again, just at Collider Video. Fire in your questions. We take Twitter questions every single day. Natasha, what have you picked out? Peter Constable asks, how long do you think the Star Wars anthology series will go for? They'll take longer breaks or try to do one film each year for as long as possible. Uh, how long it'll go for is impossible to say, at least for the next five, six, seven right. years for sure. All it takes is a couple of bombs to stop it, mm -hmm. sure, but we're not there yet. So I think they're going to stick to the one a year for a while. I know I know, Christian and I have this discussion a lot. I'm still kind of on, on the fence. I think they're going to stick to one a year for a while, and it's indefinite. It's going to keep going until there's a reason to not do them anymore. I happen to be on the one a year uh, train right now. I think oh. eventually that they'll be two a year, but I think for right now, because I do think that after the saga films, seven, eight, and nine are done, they're gonna take a break mm -hmm. from those films. And I think that anthology is gonna be the only films that they do for a little bit. And for at least the next five to eight to 10 years, you're gonna see a movie 
once a year, and you might see, like, let's let's say hypothetically, Obi Wan comes out uh, in two years from now, and it's so good that they want to do a trilogy and it opens mm -hmm. itself up every two years. You could see the Obi Wan thing, and it would still be an anthology film. And then in between, you'd get other ones. So I think that they're going to go on for a little bit. This is a, this is going to be their playground where they can start to develop new things, brand new, make the 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 entire galaxy bigger than mm -hmm. just the Obi-Wan movie or the, you know, the the, the C3PO movie or whatever they they they're going to do, you can develop brand new characters and that's the the place to do it. Why is it that the, it's a hesitation with Star Wars? Like with Marvel we're getting 2 to 3 movies a year, but with Star Wars the question keeps coming up like, you know, will they keep on this one once a year? It, it almost seems like small doing just one a year. Is it just cuz it's Star Wars or why is there a different conversation not going I on with I think that it goes back to what we were just talking mm. about. Mm. I think that right now when you see Star Wars, you think yeah. that, ah, two movies two movies a year is just too much for Star Wars. You're going to oversaturate us. Right. But what they haven't been able to do yet, what they're starting to try to do is the same thing Marvel has done, mm -hmm. creating the subgenres inside of the larger genre. So when you do a when you do a Han Solo movie and that comes out, and if it is indeed like the buddy action comedy mm -hmm. that they tell us, and it works, then we're going to have these conversations the same way. Like, well, you know what? They, they, they're so significantly different from each other that it makes sense for two. But right now, even Rogue One, Rogue One and Episode Four really are not so far off in tone. Yeah, yeah. it's like the, you have certain characters that are very different, but it feels like it connects right into it. So one a year to people is like, I got it enough of Star Wars for, and I, for me, you give me five a year and I'm fine, but that's not the average. The other no, thing yeah. to keep in mind too is that the MCU, we, we, we addressed this on Movie Talk or uh, Mailbag last week. The MCU is not a franchise. The MC, Star Wars is a franchise. The MCU is not a franchise. The MCU is a collection of a large amount of franchises under one umbrella. Right. So instead of like, well, yeah, the MCU can do three movies a year, but we're, we don't want three Ant-Man movies a year. Yeah. We don't want three Spider-Man. Right. So that's one thing I think a lot of people forget is that Star Wars is one franchise. The MCU is a collection of multiple franchises. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on, on that level, not to mention, comic books have 5,000 characters with 60 years of history of stories and thousands upon thousands of stories with names that are very recognizable to the public already, and they mm -hmm. can do certain things like that. Star Wars is a little bit of a different thing. So, I, I mean, that's how I would see the, diff yeah, the difference between them. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next, Natasha? Okay, Goat asks, how do you guys feel about Elizabeth Banks' comments in regards to Steven Spielberg not casting women in leading roles? Um, I, look, I, I've said this before, I will say it again, there are not many laws of men that I wouldn't break for Elizabeth Banks. Uh, mm -hmm. I adore that lady. I think she's super talented, she's super personable, super funny, she's great. However, I think her comments are misplaced here. I really do. I mean, remember Steven Spielberg, we were asking, why don't you cast more ladies and female in the lead roles? Was she supposed was he supposed to cast a woman in the lead role in Schindler's List? No. Should he have cast a, a woman in the lead role of Saving Lincoln? Private, right. Or Saving Private mm -hmm. Ryan? Um, or I mean, or, or Bridge of Spies, he do, or or Munich. I mean, he does a lot of movies based on true stories. I mean, remember, and Spielberg doesn't write his own scripts. I mean, he picks the stories he wants to tell. The one he did with DiCaprio, Catch Me If You Can, was right. he supposed to replace it's true story characters? Yeah, true stories, yeah. right. <laughs> so when when you go to things like like with BFG, he did. He cast. He he did a story with right. a little girl in the lead role. Obviously, the Color Purple, things like that. But I think most of his films, he's just done films. A lot of them based on true stories that are based around male characters. Now. You can then make the argument, should Spielberg in his career have picked more stories that had females in the lead characters? Maybe, maybe not, but the stories that appeal to him are the stories that appeal to him, and he's picked them and moved forward with them. So while I adore Elizabeth Banks, personally, I think her comments are misplaced here. What do you think? I do too, and I understand, and I, and I, I applaud her for, for, what she, for where she's going, what she's, what, is she, what she's saying overall is that with more opportunities, and we talked about this yesterday, there are more opportunities now for women to be involved in film. We are at an age now that we weren't at two years ago, three years ago, where whether or not women could carry a movie it's irrelevant. It wasn't. They weren't giving the. They weren't really giving a lot of mm -hmm. chances to do it. And now with something like with with Wonder Woman, uh, Force Awakens, Hunger wrong, Games, wrong one, Hunger Games, right? So within the last five years, so it, it, there's a lot more chances here now too. Now whether or not Steven Spielberg should have given another woman a shot back in the day with other movies that he picked, we don't know because certain movies like you're talking about didn't call for it. But she, he has to to say, in general, that he's never done it. I think is the place that it's misguided mm -hmm. because 
Color Purple, Sugar Land Express. Uh, always, you could say, if you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. So there are movies. Now, whether or not he maybe should have done more, that's another conversation. But to say never, you got to be careful before you call out one of the greatest directors of all time, plus the fact that he is a guy that is not one of these kind of chauvinistic you know, he, the guy is such a, I mean, he fights for the rights for a lot of different races, uh, you know, yeah. genders. I mean, he he's out there. It's it's. The, I think it's just a wrong, it's it's a good fight, but picking the fight with the wrong person, does that, mm -hmm. does that make sense? So yeah. I, I think, kind of think that that's what it was. Because I understand what she's doing. I applaud her for, for making the statement, but not to Steven Spielberg. I don't think it, it works. It's a tough argument because we're, it's getting better. I mean, we are seeing more diversity out there everywhere. I mean, Donald Glover is building his own empire, you know, in television. He's got the Deadpool spinoff series. He's got Atlanta, one of the hottest new shows last year. It's getting better, but we're still not there yet. Anybody could come out and attack anybody like Steven Spielberg be like, well, look at Rogue One, look at Force Awakens, like, look at Hunger Games. How come there's no black woman? Like, how come Lupita couldn't get that role? Would Lupita be cast in there? I mean, Lupita's in Star Wars, but in a lead role where she's not in CGI? Maybe not. We're not, maybe we're not there yet, but things are getting better. I think it's unfair to attack Steven Spielberg specifically because, like you said, John, he hasn't picked a film where a female would, could lead a, a role like that. So I don't, right. it's not his fault. Yeah, it's not no, his fault. I agree. All right, what's next? <laughs> okay, El Franco asks, what films do you think have been hurt by presumptions and comparisons like Man of Steel compared to Reeves' Superman? Yeah, com mm. comparisons, I th look, I, I think it's fair to compare in the sense of styles. I think it's fair to compare movies in the sense of styles. So for instance, we look at a movie like Rough Night. It's fair to, because they're, they're there, it's just fact. There clearly are comparisons to be made with Weekend at Bernie's. There are comparisons to be made with, what was the name of Hangover, that? Hangover, Very Bad Hangover, Things. Hangover, Very Bad Things is the other one. It, it's fair to compare. Now, where I get a little frustrated, mm. and, it's, and it's fair to, for you to say too, hey, you know what, I thought this movie was better than that movie. That's fair too. Where I get frustrated is when people think that a comparison has to be superior in every sense. Here's an example of that. Mm -hmm. Here's what I mean. When uh, a remake of a movie comes out, let's say, let's say for argument's sake, somebody makes a remake of The Godfather, whatever. The question I think we should be asking, is it fair to look at the comparisons between the original Godfather and the new Godfather? Sure it is. Is it fair to say one is better than the other? Sure it is. But when like a sequel or a remake or something comes out and the first question is, yeah, but is it better than the original Godfather? Well, that's a ridiculous question to ask. Right. I mean, that's 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 totally ludicrous. Or when we go to see, uh, when we go to see, you know, when I see Wonder Woman, and somebody, the first question somebody asked me, okay, and I did. I had people ask me this. The first question people asked me was it better than Dark Knight? Was it better than Dark Knight? And I'm like, why the hell does it have to be better than Dark Knight for it mm -hmm. to be good? I mean, we're only talking because if, if that's your logic, then nobody should ever make another crime movie ever again because nothing is ever, no crime movie is ever going to be better than Godfather. So, like, why should anybody? No, we should just ask, is it good? Draw comparisons, see where one thing is better than the other. But to make that the standard or the criteria that we have, that's where I get frustrated. I just think sequels always, absolutely, every, sure. every single time a sequel comes out, it's a matter of they're going to be unfairly compared right away you know mm -hmm. whether you know you get lucky and you get the empire strikes back that is better than a than a really great movie like new hope uh it doesn't happen often so i think that every sequel is going to have that road to you know, to, to stumble you have to figure out how can i do you not be compared to the first movie like there are certain comedies that have done it in the past but it's rare mm -hmm. whether it's uh, austin powers 2 um, whether it's because uh, Hangover Two certainly didn't do it, but uh, 20, <laughs> Twenty Two Jump Street, there, right, yeah. there's very rare movies that can do it. But I think that right away it's a little unfair. Let's like, say a movie like Twenty Two Jump Street comes out, it's like, well, it's not going to be better than the first one. Can it be better than the first one? That's that's kind of the comparisons I see. What do you think? I agree. Uh, for me, it was Prometheus. Um, I know right. a lot of people kept comparing it. I was like, well, oh, where's the Xenomorphs? It's not like it's not like the original Alien or Aliens. I'm like, that's I actually appreciated that because I thought really Scott was trying to do something different. I don't know if he succeeded in every way, but I appreciate him trying something different. So that's that's one example there. I don't think, yeah, I think it's unfair. I think as critics, we try to judge something on its own merits. Yeah. You know, whether it's a television show or a movie, we just try to sit there, judge it. This is the film that presented before us. Let's take it in. Yeah, if you saw a remake of The Godfather, of course, you're going to see Al Pacino, you're going to see De Niro from Godfather 2 in your head, but you have to take it at face value. You can't, I think it's an unfair, I think it's a competitive thing we were talking about earlier. People like to have something that has to be better or worse than something else. It's that whole competitive nature we were talking about earlier. And I, I think it's a misnomer to think it's an either or scenario. Mm -hmm. It's not you either judge a film on its own merits 
or you draw comparisons with other things. I think you can draw comparisons between films and other films of its ilk and still judge it on its own merit. So it shouldn't be an either or right. scenario. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank my guests today. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. David Griffin. David, where can people find you? You can find me, of course, here every Monday at Collider TV Talk with uh, Josh McCougish, Native Freeze, and Emma Fife. Be sure to check that out. Also on Twitter and Instagram at GriffinDE. Sitting right beside me, coming up a little bit later today with Jedi Council, Mr. Christian Harloff. Uh, John just mentioned it, Jedi Council with myself, Ken Knapsack, Mark Riley, and Tiffany Smith. Make sure you check that out. And tomorrow, the big match between Josh McCuga and Drew McWeeny on the Schmodown. And, of course, our host today, Natasha Martinez. Natasha, where can people find you online? You guys can find me watching 7 Meters Down, <laughs> and you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. By the way, for all those great artists, talented artists who watch us and are fans of the show, I would love a 7 Meters Down poster. If you could send me a 7 <laughs> Meters Down poster, that would be great. You guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Camby. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.